गुड मॉर्निंग एवरीबॉडी गुड मॉर्निंग माय नेम इज आंग सोका दिस इज माय ग्रेट प्लेजर टू बी हियर आई एम अ सेंट्रल ब्रेंग फ्रॉम इंडोनेशिया एंड देन वी हैव अ वेरी वंडरफुल सेशन दिस मॉर्निंग दिस दिस नून we are going to have a uh, four wonderful speakers and then because we have a very limited times i'm going to give them each one of them 10 until 12 minutes to talk but let me open this uh this conference with a uh, pantun in indonesia there is a kind of like um, there is a rule if i Uh, if i say something then you have to answer me with a uh, cakep just like this cakep means good okay if i say the the line then you have to answer it reply it by cakep okay ready jalan-jalan ke negeri kelantan tidak lupa membawa kudapan Bersama kolaborasi dengan ASEAN, mengamankan biodiversitas untuk masa depan. One more time. Minum teh selagi hangat. Jangan lupa dipegang kuat-kuat. Mari kita mulai, mulai rapat dengan penuh semangat. Untuk dunia yang lebih baik, kita berbincang dan berbuat. Okay. Thank you so much for a very warm welcome. Uh, we have... Uh, Professor Jatna, and then Professor Jun, and then Mr. Winston, and then Professor Lee, and then I will give uh, the first uh, the first session for Professor Jatna. Let me uh, read his bio. Professor Jatna is a prominent conversation conservation biologist and environmentalist from Indonesia. He currently serves as the chairman of the Institute for Sustainable Earth and Resources. ICER at Universitas Indonesia and is a professor in the Department of Biology. With expertise in climate change and biodiversity, he has represented Indonesia at international conferences and meetings. Professor Supriyatna is the co-chair of the UN Sustainable Development Solution Network SCSN for Indonesia and the chairman of Perwaku or Indonesia Environmental Risk Scholar Association. He has received esteem awards including the officer of the most excellent order of the Golden Ark and the Habibi Award for his research achievement. Professor Supriyatna is a member of the Indonesia Academy of Science, or IP, and serves as the executive director of the Indonesian Science Fund, DP. His contribution to conservation and environmental work have made a significant impact in Indonesia and beyond. By 2022, Professor Yatna Supriyatna had authored 28 books primarily focused on Indonesia's biodiversity and environment. He has also published over 180 articles in renowned international journals such as Science, Nature, Conservation, Biology, Primates, Evolution, Primate Conservation, Herpetologica, and others. Without further ado, Professor Yatna, the floor is yours. Please give a warm welcome to Prof. Prof. Yatna. Good morning, selamat pagi, Bapak Ibu, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the rewilding. This is a new term in conservation biology. The new term that mostly how do we progressively change action. So they call it rewilding, this is a new term. So I want to talk about this challenge and opportunity the biodiversity protection and climate change mitigation in Indonesia. So, where, where I have to go to see this one? Okay, let me uh, tell you about Indonesia. The, the nature, natural beauty, and also geology and other things. I think Indonesia is a very unique, We have uh, 17,000 islands, you know, it must be. And plus, if you see that, we have sea level rise many times and tsunami uh, 100 times. So that that's really the beauty of Indonesia. Plus with 
uh, volcanoes. Uh, we have 127 volcanoes, plus, uh, uh, of course, the mountains and 100 mountains and, and so on and so on. But the other hand, is also good because we have so many biodiversity, what we call the mega biodiversity countries. So here is the Indonesia. I think uh, it's uh, almost compete with Brazil. You know that uh, we have 10% uh, of the world uh, flowering plants, 12% of the world mammal species, and 25% of the world fish species, and many other. I just just name it. I just don't want to focus on that. But also we have the coral reef with together with uh, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, Philippines, and many others. We have, of course, the... But I want to talk about this uh, on how do we rewilding. The problem facing Indonesia, just like many other countries in Southeast Asia and also in Brazil, we always has a problem with land conversion because that revenues from the conversion because of the forest and other things is really the asset, you know. Then, of course, the Indonesia are trying to catch up with that infrastructures and many other things. That making that, of course, these are problematic in the future, yeah. So, uh, the problematic, just like in Malaysia, Indonesia is the, the largest producer uh, of palm oils, you know. It's about 16.8% uh, a million. Maybe, I don't know how many. Uh, it's like one and a half Jaffa Island. So you can imagine that it's this so extensive that that's really the producing about 50% uh, more of the palm oil in the world. But that's really the, the risk of being conversion especially in the areas of the peatland, that was really making, you know, that Indonesia also exported the haze. Not only <laughs> the haze, we, we exported the haze because of that, because of the, 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 the fires, as mentioned, but the fire is in Indonesia, that's really rag almost every year. And the worst one, especially during the El Nino times. So what's happened that really uh, the habitat loss, it's also a very, um, very big one, you know. Habitat loss, that deforestation and degradation, the impact is the, the, the fires impact to Malaysia, to Singapore, to many other countries. But at the same time, you know, that our also uh, result of our papers mentioning that they call the empty forest syndrome, which means that, of course, that the biodiversity loss is really significant. So that's why what we call is the empty forest syndrome. I would like to turn to Kalimantan because this is my favorite uh, islands where I studied since very long time ago. So this is the plan and also implemented, which is basically how do the government trying to uh, use this, the road infrastructure because our president really think that the development is really related to infrastructures. So you can see that the impact of the road development across Borneo or Kalimantan, Indonesia, is really a big impact. So making a lot of endangered species becoming really, really significantly uh, a problem in the future. Here is the deforestation in Kalimantan, part of those. Uh, you can see from the 1950 up to 2020, then I predicted 2030. So that's a glimpse, you know. It's really hard to maintain that good 
uh, forests because of the need for uh, development is very harsh. You can see that the, in the province, compare Sarabha, Sarawak also, you can see that the, the, the impact. But recently, uh, uh, last year, or even this year, the WRI researched that Indonesia has successfully that reducing the deforestation. So that was really the dramatic uh, change. Why is it? Because the president said moratorium for the whole conversion of the forest in many other countries, many other provinces in Indonesia. That's really big impact. So that's why I think everybody appraised this, that is opportunity, you know, after the risk, you know, being for many, many years, then the opportunity come because of that, right? So, but also is that risk or opportunity, the new capital, Jakarta, so the Indonesian capital will move from Jakarta to the East Kalimantan. So here is the East Kalimantan, what they call the new capital cities. So I am really involved on this development. We hope that the capital city will be the called the capital, the most, uh, the most, the the uh, the capital that really embracing the forest. So it's only moving only a few million. It's not like Jakarta is a twenty million. So. They also, you can see that this is the already built. Then, of course, what does science? What science can be help this, can help? The bioindicators, the ecological monitoring, rest, and then restoration, the graded land. So with this, hopefully that we're going to have together all this university in Borneo and trying to look after the forest. And we'll see and monitoring and tell the government this is not right, this is something and other things. So, but at the same time, you know, this is we have national park. We have seven national park in Indonesia. And that national park also hold the endangered species of orangutans. So hopefully to make sure that those uh, also uh, can protect the orangutan in Borneo. And this is really the national park that really, of course, is a big national park, uh, but it's not connecting one with the others. And in fact, it's becoming islands. So how do we get this one? And we have 21 species of the primate in the small uh, in the, the island of uh, Borneo, Indonesian Borneo. And if you compare with others that uh, in Sabah and Sarawak, it's maybe about 25. So the only in Indonesia is only 21 species. Then you can imagine if they lost because of this, uh, uh, the solution, how do we get this solution? So because we talk about this uh, in the, and the uh, session just uh, finished and we talk the solution. How do we get the solution? We have uh, put the camera trap in many other different places. So the camera trap can tell a lot of things. So for example, uh, the, the endangerment, population, the ecological problem, and so on and so on. So we have our programs together with other university and NGOs to work with and trying to understand what the population and other things. So this is the ideas of the heart of Borneo, just like uh, Lula initiative, but this is, has been long time, since 2007, right? So we're trying to do that and then unfortunately this is a hole for quite a long time because of the need development. So I think currently, what the solution? The solution, I have only two more minutes, so I, I'm trying to get this. 
<laughs> very fast. What's the solution? Ecotourism. One of those is ecotourism. Trying to get this. How much money? In USA, is about $800 billion. A big money. So we need to change paradigm. Shifted paradigm into these opportunities. For example, also how do we get the sustainability the extractive industry? Which one is the industry are really making this worse for the environment? For example, we see that between the rice, sago, oil palm. Which one is really making this emission more than than others? So then we have to, to look at it in the areas. And then, of course, this is the biggest solution currently because I have one more minute. That is really the carbon trade. Indonesia just passed the law last month. So that's what, last month, see, 2023. So this is the process. The process is a very long times. But currently, that the Indonesian agree to have carbon trade. So this is really the opportunity, and you can see that now already 100 people the want to have concession, especially to change from the oil palm concession, from all those things, to get this becoming a conversion into what you call it afforestation and def uh, avoiding deforestation, REDD. So, this is really the biggest things in Indonesia. If we can do it, I think Indonesia really, especially in Borneo, I think the people think about why we have to convert the forest into the oil palm, into the rubber plantation, into any other, because of the price. Because we study, for example, the peatland, is one hectare of the peatland is about 1,000 ton of CO2. You can imagine, if you compare with the oil palm, it's only about, maybe, it's half of those carbon. So now, the, the carbon is about $5 per ton in Indonesia right now. Well, in Singapore, in many other countries, it's about ten dollars. You can imagine the peatland one one thousand ton, time ten dollars per hectare. So that's really big opportunity for Indonesia and many others to make this the corridor, the Lula initiative. We can do it also. Why not? So I think this is the last one. Thank you very much. Much, Prof. Yatna. Let me uh, introduce you, uh, Dr. Jun. Dr. Junaina Sulehan is a professor in sociology of development and currently on secondment to the University College Sabah Foundation, USCF Kota Kinabalu from University Kebanggaan Malay Malaysia. At USCF, you, uh, Dr. Jun is the director of Center for Research Innovation and Management, CRIM, and director of the Institute for New Studies, IBS. She is also a teaching member of the Faculty of Development and Multicultural Studies at the university. She is actively involved in research concerning, concerning development and social transformation in, Sarabah, in, in Sarawak and Sabah. Her areas of research include gender, women and development, urbanization and social change, poverty, indigenous culture, social cohesion of border communities in Borneo. At CRIM and IBS, her research concerns the ethnography of indigenous communities, focusing on the communities living within the maritime and terrestrial parks in Sabah and conservation areas of the Sabah Foundation. She publishes in books and journals emphasizing on issues related to her research. Dr. June is affiliated to academic association, local and foreign NGOs, concerning advocacy on women's leadership and empowerment and actively involved in students' activities and the yearly Global Students' Mobility Program at UKM, where she had been the founding coordinator. We are going to, uh, to, the, to hear the, the video, please.
Sabah is known for its rich biodiversity and multicultural heritage. It is a home to diverse ecosystems including rainforests, mangroves, coral reefs and highland habitat. The region's exceptional natural beauty and diverse indigenous community, traditions and language make it a unique and fascinating place, popularly known as the land below the wind. This talk aims to share the complex conservation and sustainability challenges in Sabah. Today, I want to highlight the need for collaboration across disciplines to understand the interconnectedness of natural and social system, inclusivity and equitable development in this state. Inevitably, there are gaps across disciplines in search of the environment and its people. The synergy between natural science and social science enables a multi-dimensional exploration of the intricate relationship between nature and society. To add strength to this talk, this video shares footage of research conducted by our researchers and students. Being a young university, UCSF through its research institute, IBS, centers, and the four faculties is actively working on integrated study from both the social and natural science disciplines. The Research Institute is executing SDG solution projects for remote communities with funding from the APGGM since 2020. The success and extension of the solution projects is a testimony of participatory action research involving inclusivity and sustainability principles and applying integrative discipline. But the challenges are enormous, particularly the issues of remoteness, inadequate digital and physical infrastructures, and research funds. Forests and people are integral in Sabah. The unique multicultural mix of ethnic groups exudes colorful and vibrant cultures and traditions. With an estimated population of 3.9 million in the 2022 statistic, Sabah has a relatively sparsely populated areas where more than half of its population still live in rural and remote areas. Sabah population is heterogeneous and has an official record of 35 ethnic groups and 238 sub-ethnics. Diversity of norm, custom and tradition are in fact very closely influenced and shaped by the environment. People's livelihood is also dependent on the forests, rivers and seas. For centuries, their dependence on the natural environment is a manifestation of their way of life and tradition. Demonstration of this close relationship with the environment is the traditional conservation of the rivers and forests called Tagal. The region's commitment to conservation and preservation of cultural heritage contribute to its appeal as a destination of both nature lovers and those interested in exploring diverse cultural tradition. The state government has made significant efforts to protect its biodiversity through the establishment of protected areas such as national parks and wildlife reserves. Conservation initiatives focus on preserving habitat, combating illegal wildlife trade, and promoting sustainable land use practices. The forests of Sabah host a diverse array of plants and animal species. The richness of the biodiversity are mostly located here and the rest are found in the maritime areas. The actual size of the forest area in Sabah is 4.7 million hectares, based on the 2018 data. As of 2022, the totally protected areas or TPAs of Sabah is 1.9 million hectares or some 26% of the total land area. The goal is to achieve not less than 30% TPAs by 2025 or even earlier. To achieve this, local agencies and institutions are tirelessly working toward the conservation of the forest areas and sustainable development of surrounding areas where diverse ethnic groups live.
enriched with biodiversity, a total of 25,000 hectares of forest have been rehabilitated by for Sabah Foundation under the Innofrice Phase Rainforest Rehabilitation Project or Infapro and Innofrice IKEA Tropical Forest Rehabilitation Project or INIKEA. Both projects become a model of forest rehabilitation in this region. Sabah Park is another leading agency enforcing the park amendment 1984. As of 2022, there are nine parks, of which three are terrestrial parks and six are marine parks under the custody of Sabah Parks. In addition, the Sabah Foundation also plays crucial role towards conservation of the biodiversity. Under the Sabah Foundation, it has established five unique ecosystems of the conservation areas. These are the Danum Valley, the Malia Basin, the Imba Canyon, the Silam Coast, and the Taliwas River. These conservation areas become a living lab for researchers of several disciplines from the natural and social sciences. Students and researchers registered with USF are allowed to conduct free research in any of these conservation areas. UCSF utilizes the state's conservation areas to promote its green agenda embedded within the university's green concept and philosophy. Collaborative research efforts involve experts from both social and natural science can actually generate innovative solutions by drawing on a diverse method, knowledge and perspective. For example, addressing environmental in Sabah like destruction of habitat or deforestation requires not only scientific expertise but also understanding the human behavior, the policy frameworks and socio-economic factors Integrating discipline allows for a more accurate assessment of social implication of scientific findings and development of a more context-specific strategy. Social science contributes by analyzing the social, political, and economic structures that shape political policy decision and governance processes. By integrating natural science insight, policymakers can make evidence-based decisions that account for long-term ecological consequences and the social implication of their action. The interdisciplinary approach helps create policies that are not only environmentally sound but also socially just and inclusive. In addition, integrating social and natural science in educational curricula can help develop a new generation of professionals who have a comprehensive understanding of sustainability challenges. At UCSF, students from all faculties are required to take interdisciplinary courses. Thus, they can learn to analyze complex problems and collaborate with diverse stakeholders to find inclusive solutions. This approach also encourages critical thinking, empathy and assistance perspective which are essential for addressing sustainability challenges effectively. In summary, integrating social science and natural science offers a powerful approach to sustainability and inclusivity. By combining this perspective, we can better understand the complex interplay between social and natural system, engage diverse stakeholders, develop effective policies, and educate future generation. That's all for now, I hope 
you have enjoyed this short presentation. Terima kasih. Thank you so much, Professor Jun, for a very wonderful movie. For me, it's a movie. It's kind of like I'm waiting for the kind of like the the bigger story. Uh, let me go to the third speaker first. Let me introduce you, uh, Mr. Winston. Winston Peng is the founding president of the Society of Certified Risk Professionals. So we bring also the uh, the the professional in finance sector here. A multidisciplinary collaborative platform for scientists, regulators, and independent professional to address sustainability risk. Mr. Winston began his career at Arthur Anderson and started his own firm at the age of 25, in such a young age. In 1997, he pioneered and led the region's management assurance in industry for over a decade. In 2009, he designed and implemented a water risk management system for a state using predictive technologies. He spent the following 10 years managing risk for a megastructure mega GOC. State Economic Development Corporation, National Productivity Agency, and various government ministries. He has written guidebooks for government regulators, ran risk assessment labs, and facilitated regulatory sandboxes. Winston has organized national conferences on social sustainability and contributed for government to government for citing strategic road mapping and bilateral sessions. He is actively engaged in corporate sustainability and pursuing the development of sustainability sustainable industrial parks and a hydrogen ecosystem. Without further ado, Mr. Winston, the floor is yours. Good morning and congratulations, Dr. Jun. Very nice video. And we have got Malaysia's uh, Sir David Attenborough. Huh? I thought, yeah. <laughs> okay, and uh, today I'll be talking about pricing climate risk and, uh, and biodiversity risk as well. So this came about because uh, I'm involved in uh, working on this task force for climate-related financial disclosures, and it is always very challenging to sort of uh, uh, map right uh, climate science to financial impacts. So um, sustainable development is about you know managing consequences, the way we live and the way we do business. So uh, you know, if you look at this uh, decision and outcome uh, diagram tree, right, in a simple, in a in a very simple format, and you will see that uh, there are also um, intervention tools that we can use, right. But in reality, it doesn't look so simple. Huh? In reality, it looks like that, all right. <coughs> so, and uh, we know that. Look here, you know, uh, when I started the SCRP in 2017, I said, look here, there's no way I can handle this, and we need to get all the scientists in, all right. So, and uh, scientific knowledge is critical in understanding climate causes and consequences, all right? So, but today, I'm also a bit concerned because a lot of uh, accounting firms and management consultants, right, they are dominating the uh, sustainability space. So, we need uh, the uh, science-based uh, professionals to be uh, more involved in the space, right? So, and um, <clears throat> because they are, the, the causality loop is so complex, it is uh, good if government can come up with a national level, um, what do you call that, uh, a causality chain. Let's say, for example, for biodiversity, start with a just transition vision and principles, then uh, work on uh, whether you want to go the SSP1 or SSP2 pathway, and then uh, select whether you want to go RS RCP2.6 or 4.5, and then look at the uh, national mitigation policies, energy, uh, AFOLU, buildings, transport, industry, and then it becomes easier for us to translate to the organizational level, all right? So, and uh, yep, uh, a lot of relationships. And uh, basically, you know, when you talk about TCFD, um, uh, the corporates now are facing challenges in uh, pricing, right? Uh, the impacts of uh, sustainability to, uh, to, their, to their financial statements, right? So uh, when we try to price uh, um, uh, sustainability or climate risk to financial impacts, it means we are trying to value the company, right? So uh, only with, with this, we can then do a proper scenario analysis. So if you talk about risk, <coughs> risk is an uncertainty and it's a 200-year-old science. It's basically probability multiplied by your loss or gain, right? So uh, climate events carry complex dependencies probabilistic method is needed. 
So if you look at conventional methods, all right, uh, consultants are using, for example, probability of uh, three uh, events in a chain. So we know that uh, when, you know, when uh, uh, probabilities are conditional, so we multiply their probabilities. But if you use high, medium, and low, what do you get when you get when you multiply with high, medium, and low? What do you get, right? Or if let's say mutually exclusive events, red plus yellow plus green, what do you get? And that is why you know in the past 20 years, right, uh, the largest bankruptcies in the history of mankind occurred, right? Uh, the top 10 of them, half of them are financial institutions, and it occurred under their watch. Okay, ordinal skills are not effective almost impossible to sort of measure risk. So how to measure anything? I've come up with a you know, formula. You can take a picture and go home and try, right? So use your uh, uh, Excel to work it out. Basically, uh, it's very simple. You look at all the, uh, the risk events, okay, possible uh, risk events, impute a probability there. You can make it even more complex, like conditional or even uh, you know, a posterior probability like base, right? So, and then um, uh, what you do is this. Um, you can do a Delphi, ask your participants who are basically your experts, right? And then ask them, right, uh, after getting a probability uh, that you have, uh, after determining a probability, you can ask them, look here, with 90% 90, 90 confidence, uh, you know, uh, level, what is, the, what is the range of losses, all right, uh, that, you can, uh, uh, that you can give me, okay? For example, if uh, government change regulations on uh, EV vehicles, then uh, it will affect your sales between, say, 100 to 300 million. You use that range. Okay, so this formula basically means your mean and your standard deviation there, right? So, okay, and what you are getting at is, uh, is a loss exceedance curve. So you want to be able to interpret the data saying, for example, there's a 90% chances that you will lose 180 million and there is a 5% chance of losing, say, 430 million based on this uh, data itself. And you can perform sensitivity analysis and uh, stress testing from this, right? So temporal earnings, losses and gains, your P multiple and valuation can be estimated for your organization, right? In short, that is what uh, we can do, okay? So, and uh, in uh, measuring sustainability risk, I also want to uh, bring our attention you know, to this uh, thing that I have, that I've been thinking about, right? So 85% of uh, tropical forests reside in the global south. 90% uh, of the global population live here, and they generate only 40% of uh, global GDP. So when we quantify risk and when we price risk, all right, there's always a pressure and uh, worry about what uh, uh, sanctions that we may face in a certain business if our carbon footprints are high, our ecological, ecological footprints are high and all that, and how do we sort of bring them down? So, and, uh, and I, I, bring, I, I would like to you know, bring this uh, to our attention because I think this is something that we can uh, do for biodiversity, right? So the global north has significantly higher GHG emissions per capita, and they, they are setting the rules for us. And climate equity is uh, really needed. If you look at us, we are here, Southeast Asia. Our uh, GHG per capita is basically relatively low compared to, let's say, these countries, right? So, and uh, China probably high, but their per capita footprint is uh, pretty low, okay? And they have already developed, all right? And now they are setting the rules for us, okay? So, and um, just transition dialogues are largely absent in the global south. And if you can see from here, they are all in the global north, more developed countries. So only probably two or three countries uh, in the global south have have uh, talked about uh, just transition. So I'm calling for a just transition for the global south in terms of uh, tropical biodiversity, right? So, you know, uh, hopefully SDSN can sort of uh, take it up and uh, work on this. So, and uh, ultimately, um, SDSN as an uh, academic, uh, you know, uh, outfit as well, uh, you can help industry by coming up with, uh, with all the scenarios uh, from biodiversity and climate change so that, uh, you know, assist government in coming up with all these uh, uh, scenarios for us to sort of uh, uh, link it up to the, uh, to the uh, corporate scenario planning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Winston. Let me uh, read the bio for Professor Lee. Professor Lee Kai Earn is currently the head of the Research Center for Sustainability 
Science and Governance SGK at the Institute of Environment and Development or Lestari University Kebangsaan Malaysia. His expertise is on green technology and sustainability management. He is a professional technologist of the Malaysia Board of Technologies or MBIOT, a panel accredited mediator of the Bar Council Malaysian Mediator Center as well as global certified ESG practitioner. He is currently leading a research excellence consortium on water Name Integrated Water Research Synergy Consortium or IWERES under the Ministry of Higher Education Malaysia. Professor Lee, the floor is yours. Selamat tengah hari dan salam sejahtera. A very good afternoon to everyone. Thank you uh, Dr. Asunka for the kind introductions. Uh, my name is Lee Kayan, a uh, professor in the uh, University of Kelabangsa Malaysia, National University of Malaysia. So um, today, I only have one slide, just like our Earth. We only have one planet. <laughs> I try to keep it short. All right. So um, basically, I'd like to share about what are the initiatives we are running uh, at UKM as, as well as our uh, collaborators. Right. So um, I'd like to share about the... Um, this is the uh, consortium, the Research Excellence Consortium approved by the Ministry of uh, Higher Education name it as an Integrated Water Research Synergy Consortium, or call it IWES, which is a consortium that uh, uh, focusing on the niche area of water. Right, we have three uh, members universities, which is headed by uh, University of Malaysia, Malaysia, and we have two satellite from uh, University of Malaysia Sabah, as well as uh, University of Technology Mara. Right, so what we do is uh, we, we approach the uh, water research with the uh, multi-dimensional approach where we look at the uh, different issues that we have so we um, in our research or our research program we take the uh, three particular areas right uh, uh, before that no doubt water is one of the very essential elements in the uh, biodiversity conservation as you can look at the sch schematic diagram over here right it is intertwined between the uh, water forest and diversity because water itself is actually the vein that connecting the uh, forests and as well as the biodiversity because for in short is forest for water water for life yeah more importantly is the biodiversity so in this context we need to have a good governance especially using science for governance using the evidence base uh, uh, for the better management so um for our program we take three uh, particular areas for as our living labs right so uh we take the approach of reach to reef, representing different uh, geographical landscape and different uh, um, from ranging from the, uh, the mountainous uh, geographical features to the terrestrial area down to the island geographic, uh, uh, geographical features. So in this program, right, uh, UMS is taking care of the Kinabalu, right? So part particularly on the Ranau area because Later on, I'll deliberate further on the, the water issue that they are facing. And uh, UKM is focusing at the Langat, where the UKM is housed. And um, UITM, um, police branch, they have a research station in Langkawi Island. So they will be looking at the, uh, the issues in Langkawi. So what are the issues? What are the water-related issues in the respective area? If you look at the uh, news that we have, over here, right? Let's talk about the uh, near to our heart first. I mean, Slango, right? Slango, right? Particularly in Langat, we 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 face a lot of water rationing year in year out because of the uh, urbanization, because of the pollutions, right? So even the um, the CM, the Chief Minister of Slango, also stressed that, that we need to have a very stringent, right, um, policy to to actually uh, address the uh, water pollution issues because particularly in Langat, right, based on our record, right? So in 2018 itself, it happens more than uh, 20 to 30 times of water rationing. All this is because of the, the human factors that contribute to the pollutions. So, and in Sabah, right, there's another dimension of the water issue, right? So they, they have a very rich biodiversity, right? So they have to conserve the water resource for the uh, uh, the better li uh, livelihood of the uh, local the, uh, communities. And in, in Langkawi, right, because 
Langkawi is known as the uh, tourism sports. Each year, they, we receive more, about uh, 3 million of tourists, but the, uh, the population in uh, Langkawi has less than a million. Right, basically, the, uh, the incoming right, demand is higher than the, uh, the, uh, the local demand. That's why the, uh, every year, right, during the peak season, right, you can see a lot of um, pollution coming out from the, uh, you, the, uh, the Sungai Klim, right, the causing the, uh, you can see a lot of news coming up, right, seeing the black water in the Sungai Klim, right. So that's the another uh, area that we need to look at it, how to balance between the uh, economic development, economic activities, and the uh, environmental conservations. So what we do in, uh, in our program is actually try to uh, promote the, uh, the sustainable water management through the concept of the approach of reach to reef, right? So taking the uh, different uh, areas as our living labs, Kinabalu, Langat and Langkawi as our living labs and try to delve into uh, the, uh, the, the root cause of the issue and try to work together closely with the, uh, uh, the stakeholder as well as the local policymakers to actually influence them to make a, a, or to adjust the uh, policy as well as the uh, strategies to better manage the water resource. So we come up with the uh, one formula, right? So how to secure the, the water resource that we have, not only looking at the water resource that we have, but also we need to reconcile the waste that we discharge. So we also need to look into the wash, right, water, right, sanitation and hygiene, right? Of course, all this cannot, uh, we cannot leave out the, uh, the integrated water resource management approach where we, tr we will take into the, the uh, multiple stakeholders and multidisciplinary approach, all right, to look into the various issues that are circular around the uh, water uh, problems that we have. But more importantly, for the longer term, we need a evolutionary governance. What is that evolutionary governance? Looking and learning from the past, failure and uh, success, and how we can actually regularly updating the policy and strategies. And eventually, we need to have the changing uh, the, uh, in terms of the uh, strategy to address the changing needs of the society and the environment. How to do that? More importantly is we need a, a longer term right, uh, research. Having this uh, living labs station long term over the, uh, at the, the site and provide the uh, real time data to the policy makers and decision makers right, and eventually to, uh, propose and recommend what are the better strategies to actually uh, manage the water. So for in the context for the uh, science panel for uh, Borneo, we are strive we, we strive to um, bring the uh, Kinabalu, right, one of our uh, research station of our living lab to become the uh, to support the uh, the science panel in providing the the real time data in terms of the water quality monitoring as well as, right. So for for information, I would like to share further what we are doing in uh, Sabah, right? As we know, in Sabah, we have a uh, target system, right, to actually regulate the, um, the fish catching, right? There's a uh, sustainable practices. But more importantly, through our research, we would infuse the modern science, the modern water science into helping the local indigenous people to better manage not only their fish catching, but also to conserve the water resource. So this is where we try to bring in the science into the policy making, governance, as well as to conserve and the, uh, the biodiversity, as well as eventually for the better economic development. So with that, uh, I, thanks, uh, I thank all of you for attending the, uh, the session today. So if you have any uh, questions, so you may contact me at the, contact, uh, at, the, at the bottom of the slides. All right, thank you very much. Before we, we open the discussion, let me make a quick summary. From Professor Yatna, we learn about protecting the biodiversity, especially in Indonesia. We need to protect protecting orangutan and then protecting, connecting the Kalimantan National Park is really uh, wonderful ideas. And then what is the solution? We put camera trap, program in universities and NGOs, ecological corridor, 
and then the ecotourism it's a very uh, very very wonderful ideas also sustainability of extractive industries and also the new business opportunity RADD plus in Indonesia and also thank you for the carbon trade regulation that has just recently passed thank you uh, professor Yatna and then from Dr. June we saw a very engaging movies we are waiting for a bigger uh, scenario to kind of like a marvel movies so we learn how to integrate social science and natural science it, and it can produce sound socially just and inclusive policies support education by promoting critical thinking empathy and, uh, and assistance and from mr Win winson there is a growing need for financier to price climate risk into the their portfolio thank you for the excel i will uh, definitely use it mm -hmm. and then from professor lee there are the three areas living lab slang or kinabalu we need to have a very stringent policy to address our water issues and then for Sabah, they have to conserve water resource for their biodiversity. And Langkawi as a water sport. And then approach to reach to reef. So let me give uh, three, uh, three questions from the, the audience. Uh, dear panel and uh, moderator, my name is Damien. I'm from Pertubuhan Pelindung Kasana Alam. We're called Peke in short. Uh, Peke basically means being sensitive. Um, my first question is uh, for all the panels, um, including uh, Doctor. You're from Indonesia, right? So I'm not really sure about your federal constitution. Um, Malaysia does not have an article within the federal constitution um, to to mirror the ambition to rehabilitate, preserve, and protect its natural treasures. And, uh, you know, all these years, uh, the government have been, uh, all the, 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 the political parties and, or the administration have been giving the excuse that they don't have a two-thirds majority in parliament. Basically, if it's a good thing, you know, regardless of how divided you are, you should be able, to, the, the politician should be able to uh, um, uh, support a new article being added into the federal constitution, uh, one example is uh, Undi 18, everybody supported. So now, um, would the academics and the universities encourage your students to lobby the government to amend the federal constitution to add a new article um, titled, for instance, uh, Rehabilitation, Preservation and the Protection of Our Natural Treasures? Thank you very much, um, distinguished members of the panel and Mr. Moderator. My question is to Professor Yatna. Um, I am intrigued and inquisitive as to the solution you mentioned, and perhaps you didn't have enough time to elaborate. I would really like to learn more about how tourism can have a positive impact on reforestation. Throughout the globe, we've seen negative impacts of tourism. So I'd really like to learn. Thank you. Thank you. And your name is, Mr. Sorry, I'm BK Sinha from the Malaysia Green Building Council. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Lai Jayet. Uh, I'm the project director of Social Accountability International, working on uh, human rights at deforestation risk and commodity supply chain. So I have a question uh, for Mr. Winston. <coughs> Sorry, so just now, I'm very interested in um, uh, hearing about uh, this idea of just transitions. And I totally agree that uh, in ASEAN region, as well as in Malaysia, uh, this is a very new idea that's uh, very underexplored. So I would like to hear your opinions, how you know the, the ideas as well as the executions of just transitions. Um, can be implemented in Malaysia uh, from different uh, governance levels, from communities to regionals as well as to national. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, so we have three questions. The first question from Mr. Damien, I think uh, I need Dr. June and also Professor Yatna. Maybe you could uh, share your views on it. Uh, thank you for the first, uh, Damien? Yeah. 
I just uh, want to be honest on this because in Sabah, we, uh, I can talk of my campus, we don't have yet a student's movement actively towards, you know, instigating or, I don't know what is the right word to say, to uh, a lobby, yeah, correct? <laughs> oh, sorry. Lobby uh, on these issues of conservation, rehab at the parliamentary level, okay? But we do have initiatives, especially green initiative, toward awareness of conservation of the biodiversity and empowerment of stakeholders, communities among the students. So in meaning to say that um, at our campus, we still have a long way to go. And this is honest from me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I don't know how to answer this, but... Uh, in Malaysia, maybe, I don't know, that uh, the student lobbying, whatever they call. But in Indonesia, I guess that because of thousands of NGOs, environmental NGOs there, and allow it to make demonstration in front of parliament or whatever. So I think that the pressure there. I think the NGO is a very important. The academician usually just gave this... Uh, the data, you know, how that really happened. For example, the orangutans. Now, the orangutan, of course, recently they said that, wow, there's a reducing the population of 20%. And give it then to the NGOs who's doing that because academicians usually just, of course, good, you know, they ask the parliament uh, for, uh, for interview or whatever. But the force, Mostly is the NGOs. I think that that's really. I think since after Suharto, you know the the president, thirty years ago, I think Indonesia is too very. I I believe that the very full democratic uh, countries and so every you know you can make the NGOs very easily, and that that's environmental NGOs like I don't know how many thousand of them already there, and that the government worries also. With the NGOs, so that okay. So I'm member of the they call the Indonesian Sustainable Tourism Council in the Ministry of uh, Environment. So we have the twelve uh, person member in charge on how do we get tourism. So making that sustainable tourism is in place. Especially you mentioned about this uh, forests and and other things. I think that that's really important that the ministers also force and talking with the other minister to make sure that that really, uh, especially in the national park and and sometimes it's in other places like uh, the 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 forest that it's not belong to the protection or something. So. Uh, right now, with the of course with the digital technology, the people can sell whatever they like uh, restoration, ecology, restoration something. So that making people uh, also uh, just like a tourist, you know, they come and they 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 plant it and, and so on and so on. That that's really uh, making uh, a big progress on sustainable tourism. Let me just emphasize uh, one or two things from Professor Yerna because I don't know whether uh, it is also true in Indonesia, but we in Indonesia, we love to demonstrate. <laughs> uh, I am also part of it during the Reformation, and I'm, and I'm sure Professor Yerna is also part of the... <laughs> uh, it's very easy to create the NGO, and then it's kind of like our pride to have something to say, and then... Maybe for this kind of issue to protect the biodiversity, maybe we also have that kind of uh, freedom to express our freedom and then create some organization because sometimes the government doesn't have enough information to do it. And then the academic sector will be the kind of a, our library resource of the data. And then for the, the second question, uh, Prof. Yatna, because I'm... I myself, as a central banker, also try to use the ecotourism. But the problem is, for the ecotourism, should we, I mean, the ticket for the ecotourism should is it should be should it be higher, 
or lower than the the usual tourism? What do you think, bro? I gave the case of the Komodo. Komodo Island now is the biggest uh, government uh, project. Uh, Komodo, of course, uh, is very endangered species. It's only 2,000 left. And no, no one have the Komodo other than Indonesia. And only in a small island in Komodo Island. So there's a big uh, debate between NGOs, government, uh, tourism, and everybody's. It's just like uh, it's, it's kind of the becoming uh, a scientist has two big solutions. Unfortunately, I was the set aside by the minister to talk about this. And debate is really not only in population, communities, because the local community don't get any benefit, and so on and so on. But that's the beauty. I thought that one they still allow, the government allow the NGOs to demonstrate so that, you know, tourism will not going further away, for example, because they endangerment of the Komodo. So there has a, a practice, for example, you cannot uh, follow the Komodos anymore. You have to be distant with the Komodos. And then there has to be the local community uh, as a guide or ranger not somebody outside through it. So that was really from the discussion and working together, because otherwise there will be tyranny of the, uh, the, the power <laughs> of the government usually. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Yatman. So let's just be aware, uh, because name the price of the Komodo Park will be kind of like five times higher, right, Prof? <laughs> So right now it's still kind of like 100,000 rupiah, it's kind of like 30 ringgit, but maybe 800, oh, 200 dollars. So just go to the Komodo Islands while it is still cheap. <laughs> so the, for the third question about the, uh, I cannot remember the, the idea of just transition. What is your opinion how a just transition can be implemented in Malaysia and also for, uh, in Indonesia from different level? Please, Mr. Winston. Yeah, thanks, uh, but I will just make a short comment about the uh, federal constitution part, right? So I've had a privilege of uh, sometimes being uh, referred to when I, uh, uh, to review some regulations and all that. And uh, when it comes to, let's say, Environmental Protection and uh, Environmental Quality Act, for example, right? So, um, you know, I've observed um, that, um, you know, Malaysia took, let's say, three different governments over six years and then to upgrade our EQA from, say, 80 pages to 120 pages involving some of the smartest uh, uh, people in the country, right? So I made a comment uh, and said, look here, if you look at, uh, and, and that, is, uh, that regulation was being reviewed. Malaysia has this law that you have to review every uh, regulation every five years, right, uh, through Malaysian Productivity Corporation. And... And, um, and uh, what happens is when we review regulation, we don't look at other related uh, environmental uh, regulations, right? And I can tell you we have about 39 to 40 environmental related regulations. They're not just being uh, reviewed all at one go and being uh, consolidated. So we don't really need to put this in the federal constitution. We can actually uh, go from there, right? Uh, from, the, uh, from the Environmental Act itself. So if you look at Australia, so I was making comparison, they had 1,500 uh, clauses in 700 pages, right? So, and we have only, you know, took us six years to upgrade from 80 to 120 pages. So it's quite underwhelming, right? So it's not real. It's not even, I think, uh, gazetted yet. Okay. So, uh, you know, one way is to go to the uh, ministry and basically, uh, you know, query about, you know, uh, the um, uh, how much public uh, has been consulted uh, with this how much is uh, the process is being uh, uh, reviewed or is it done by a very, you know, close um, group of people, okay, um, whether it's public enough. So, you know, that's one thing you can uh, look at, right? It doesn't have to go to the uh, federal constitution. Okay, and uh, addressing the, uh, the uh, just transition part. So, um, probably about, say, 10 years ago, I got so curious about what... Uh, uh, social sustainability is. 
uh, I spent uh, one year interviewing 300 people and uh, trying to basically understand uh, what is cultural, what are cultural assets, and um, and uh, finally, you know, uh, uh, I came to understand uh, what is it all about. Like, I think to uh, social so social uh, social sustainability, um, basically, you know, it basically generally means that uh, you don't want a community's life to be uh, disrupted the way they live, their way of life, culture, right? And uh, culture is actually an uh, uh, is an uh, is a is an asset is an asset. Community has a um, their asset built in their in their uh, cultural mechanisms. So. And we have always talked about uh, uh, environmental sustainability. So when we talk about ESG, because when you go to the corporate side, they don't uh, they use a lot of this word called ESG rather than sustainability, right? So E is environmental, S is social, G is governance. So the social part is not uh, as uh, sophisticated as the environmental part. And uh, a couple of uh, months back, I've uh, met with the uh, regulators. Uh, um, uh, Securities Commission specifically to basically um, look at the viability of implementing, let's say, for example, uh, hybrids of social impact assessment, right? Um, and uh, to be introduced to, say, local rating agencies and uh, incorporate it into uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, listing requirement, right? So if you hit the public listed companies, okay, if you capture them in, in, uh, into, the, uh, into the disclosure, um, uh, net, then uh, they will also have to look into their supply chain, and that's one way to sort of uh, effect change from uh, uh, basically top down uh, from the uh, supply chain uh, point of view. And um, and uh, one way to uh, help corporate or industry understand more about culture. So first thing is to get it documented or make it manifest. In what form? Probably uh, in uh, in storybooks, in a work of art in uh, let's say performing uh, uh, dances right and uh, and in their uh, in their community arts itself okay so and um, and uh, how do we do that basically if you look around you know we have probably about 450 uh, academic institutions in the country and if every institution produces 10 art students or art historians or you know whatever not every year you get probably about 5000 people graduating without a proper job right so they should be basically deployed to basically documenting uh, to document culture and help us uh, better understand what culture is and a lot of corporate people they just think about money right they don't understand uh, uh, culture right so this is where we can sort of uh, then start to uh, you know uh, 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 help uh, culture become more tangible and we can then uh, manage them in uh, better ways i don't know whether i've understood uh, if i've answered the question um, Thank you so much, Mr. Winston. Unfortunately, we have to end it here. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen.